why is it that South and Central America predominantly have over more cases over the decades featuring violent and traumatizing UFO encounters compared to the rest of the world? Is there a correlation to the savagery of the pre-Columbian civilizations and the worship of their gods? Today, we will cover many key cases and attempt to unravel what makes this particular part of the world such a focus for UFO attacks. Hello and welcome to another episode of Mysteries with a History, where you'll be taken on a wild ride into the unknown, the strange, and the mysterious. Like you, I have questions, and like you, I want answers. And with each episode together, we will peel away the layers to look for the truth. Please show your support for my work by hitting that like button for this video. Make sure to subscribe and also hit the notification bell as I do three live shows, sometimes four, right here on this channel on all topics from UFOs, the paranormal, and things that are unexplained. Also on this channel, I post YouTube shorts, keeping you up to date on the latest strange news. We have a lot to talk about today, so let me bring in my co-host, Jimmy Church of Fade of Black Radio. Jimmy, what an interesting way to start the show. Don't you, think? you know, what did what did I say? Crazy day. What did what did I what did I and Christina and I, you know, we're uh okay, second time's a charm. You know, we're chatting away. Okay, let's go ahead and start. Yeah, okay, we're talking about this and that. Okay, all right, crazy day, crazy. And then boom. And and I gotta say. Our first version that nobody saw was the best we've ever done. <laughs> it was perfect. The second version, I'm just letting you guys know. Christina comes in. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting uh, what's going on down in South South, South America. Because <laughs> my, my heart and dropped. She goes, she goes, I don't want to stop. I can't, I can't click the stop button. I said, you have to. It was so fun. <laughs> she goes, my heart. Okay, so anyway, um, yeah, crazy day around here. Um, I'm just going to let everybody know James Fox is here. Yeah, he's here. And uh, before everybody asked me, oh, what's he doing? Well, he's a filmmaker. He's doing film stuff. So so he's here. That's pretty exciting. And uh, I, I, I can't say any more than that. But um uh yeah, yeah. So I've I've got that going on. I'm preparing uh for Egypt. I've got a show tonight with Randall Carlson. Of course, hanging out with you today is is the bright spot of my day with all of this madness. And then we have to start off like this. But anyway, why Christina? Is it because we're going into October? And and spooky stuff and ghosts and, and, and things that we do a show today about UFOs and of the violent kind. I mean, what 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 inspired what inspired this? Because you have a world that is surrounded by puck wedgies and unicorns. Why 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 are we going there today? Don't forget the ramen and the sprinkles as well. But when it comes to the ramen recent when it comes to the recent incident that took place in Peru earlier this year, people are asking, "Oh, we want updates of what's been going on in Peru with people being terrorized in this small town in Alto Nani." And then I it got me thinking, I just honestly, just a while ago thinking you know, South and Central America, they have a lot of very unique and violent encounters. Another great example is Calaris, Brazil in 1977, one of my all-time favorite cases right next sure. to the Phoenix Lights in 1997. But if we look at other parts of the world, we can look at Canada, we can look at parts of Europe, we can look at parts of Asia, and you get a lot more subtle experiences. But in South and Central America... They are they are pretty brutal, and we have a few cases to cover today. And then it got me thinking and looking at the past, looking at the history of, well, what kind of civilizations did they have in ancient times? They were bloodthirsty civilizations. The Mayans, the Inca, the, the Olmec, and so on and so forth. These people were doing sacrifices 
on almost a daily basis to appease the gods. Well, then it makes you question who were these gods that were requiring the people to do such terrible sacrifices to the warrior clans, to children, to women, to slaves. I mean, there, there was no mercy there. And is there a correlation between the two? The thing is that it's something worth musing about. It's something worth just looking into because we don't hear it too often. We hear the aspects of Space Brothers. All aliens mm. are amazing. They want to help planet Earth. They want to see humanity evolve. But what if there are other factions, possibly, where there are some entities that have more evil intent that are using them, using people as slaves, maybe feeding off of human blood, for instance, in this case, for these certain civilizations, they believe in order to appease certain gods, like the sun god, for instance, they said they need to feed off of blood and other aspects in order to have a good harvest, in order for the sun to actually revolve around the earth. And could it be that there's some kind of unknown war between the good and the evil with these extraterrestrials? Or am I just thinking a little bit too crazy here? This was a show that I thought to myself, this is something worth talking about, musing about. And then people can make up their own mind and, and see if there's a connection or not. But it's something that I think we need to talk about. I had uh, 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 many conversations uh, with Peter Tackerin, uh, the singer um, and producer, guitar player for, for the band Hypocrisy. And the design of, and he's covered this subject a lot. Not only ET and benevolent, malevolent, and that that aspect of it, um, but uh, and there are very, you know, it's, we're talking about a very big band, right? It, you know, a world worldwide band, world class, and and his the album before the last one uh, was called Warship. But it wasn't so. Anyways, he's discussing with me the ideas for the album cover. He gets into exactly what you're talking about, and the album cover shows a Mayan pyramid, like Chichen Itzu, uh, in the background, with tens of thousands of people at the base of it, and 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 an ET standing there like this in front and they're worshiping at this Mayan temple. And what he had brought up was the, the violent, crazy sacrifices and things that were going on with an absolutely advanced culture, right? Advanced in engineering and economics and, and building of cities and infrastructure and roads and, of course, math and, and uh, astronomy and the calendar. They were so advanced, but yet there was this other aspect to them. And it, 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 I had always thought about it, but when you have somebody else, you know, bringing it up in a conversation and their research, uh, everybody has been fascinated about this. And it also reminds me, uh, I want to uh, move on really quickly. We've got a lot to cover today. But I can't remember the name of the movie. Um, Apoc Apocalypto. Apocalypto. Right. Now, now, that movie, which was amazing, it was great. The, the production, the look, it, all of that was incredible. But it was true dramatic right and think about you remember you getting painted blue you remember that whole scene and one after another you know the bodies are piling up at the bottom of that staircase and that was the aspect we you know because the, there's the side of the mayans you know so advanced and then you see something like this and it was about oh, a lot of different reasons but drought right starvation crops and and trying to keep the civilization going and and that's you know trying to appease the gods and who were those gods it it's just an incredible part of of, of history and then you throw in the ufo aspect uh to all of this and the et contact uh aspect that has absolutely gone on from the tip of south america all the way up through north america central and 
in South America. It's it's just just a fascinating part of our history. It is. And it's also very gruesome and very dark. And what's very odd as well is that, well, there have been cultures across time, across the planet that have followed into similar um, rituals. It's it's South and Central America that were very consistent with it. And there were there are a few things that I'd like to kind of talk about referring to these Mesoamerican civilizations to give people a foundation before we get into the cases here. So I'm going to share my screen here merely as a visual aid and starting off with giving a foundation on the different civilizations that once occupied South and Central America. So this first image, by the way, it was really fun making these images, but I'm going to pull up this first one. Here it is. There we go. And so the first one is the Olmec civilization. And this is generally considered the first of major civilization in Mesoamerica, arising around 1400 BCE and then declined around 400 BCE. And they are often referred to as the, quote, mother culture of late Mesoamerica civilizations. And the Olmecs were known to have practiced human sacrifice, although the details and extent of these practices are not well documented as they are um but the later civilizations such as the maya and the aztecs are a little bit more documented but the olmecs was kind of one of the first but we bring into the into the topic of why what were the reasons for this what was going through their mind when they thought you know what let's let's drop another one shall we and for them according to documentation uh, of this civilization in particular, the reason for these sacrifices are varied, but generally believed to be religious in nature. And that was a lot of reasoning uh, during that time frame. Almost anything that you would do had a religious aspect to it. And the Olmecs, like later Mesoamerican civilizations, practiced human sacrifice as a way to appease honor, or communicate with their gods. And it's believed that the gods required nourishment in the form of blood and human life to sustain the world and its natural cycles, such as rainfall and agriculture. And sacrifices were made to ensure success in warfare, fertility, and other aspects of life. This is something that we consistently see in these Mesoamerican civilizations. But the question is, why? Because, Jimmy, you brought up a really great point that needs to be emphasized. In many aspects, these were very advanced civilizations. They were familiar with agriculture. Their structures were beautiful. Their artwork is incredibly insane. I mean, so advanced for this time period and for this area. And yet they had to think of these very primitive ways to think, okay, you know, it's, it's not the water, it's not the fertilizer, it's not the manure in order to have a good crop we need to sacrifice people. And, right. the and the question is, why? How were they influenced to do that to begin with? What was the what was the first step to think, oh, we should definitely do that? And then getting everyone else on the bandwagon saying, you know what, chief? That's a brilliant idea. Let's totally go for it. For the most part, during this time frame up until present day, life is a very precious thing. It's maybe one of the only things that we actually own in a lifetime. And for them just to take it like that, yes, there's this level of control in order for your subjects to obey you, right? To be obedient. But the biggest thing is how did it all start? And we well, don't, we see, don't know. That's, no, no, that, is, that is the craziest crazy part. We today, okay, we're in 2023, and right now, today, in, in 2023, we are finding out so much about North, Central, and South America, and and how old, and how advanced, and how crazy, and how cool it, it really was. That is a radically different position than where we were just 25 years ago. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, I, just up until recent modern history, we actually thought that the uh, the American Indians, the, the indigenous cultures uh, that were here, 
was the start of it all, and that was it, right? We knew a little bit, you know, the Spanish, and that was 1500 A.D., right? And, and, and we know a little bit about that. And Christopher Columbus, 1492, right? Balboa into uh, Panama. And then, of course, you know, Cortez and everything else that came into uh, Mexico. And, and, and putting all of this into consideration, we never looked at the ancient history. We didn't know anything about anything. And stuff has just started to surface. And Machu Picchu, that's a recent discovery. That's 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 modern history. It's not like where we look at uh, Egypt or Greece or or Stonehenge or even Rome, right? Where we can look at something that's two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand years old, and we have been looking at it and studying it for thousands of years. This other stuff is all servicing the the Temple of the Sun. And uh, th there were there was a time it was photographed, covered, photographed, modern history, covered in trees and dirt and grass, right? It was then clear to, oh, holy crap, there's a pyramid under here. That's, that, and, and so when we did discuss the Olmecs, the Olmecs is, is a modern discovery. The Olmec heads that were found in the jungles Nobody knew who the culture was. Nobody knew where they came from. Nobody knew who carved them. First off, they were giant, huge boulders uh, with, with faces carved on them. And as we studied the faces and looked at them, Christina, they weren't of the indigenous cultures that are are already there. They, they, they had features, uh, African features. They had features that came from somewhere else, but not from the local populations. And that was a head scratcher. So I'm not even sure. And the Olmecs. Get it? Uh, when head, we, stra head scratcher? It's giant. Look, head. look, 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 look at that. You know, and yeah, head scratcher, literally a head scratcher. But um when when they were discovered and they just kind of looked around huh okay all right well, who 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 were they and and when were they we're we're finding out more it's it's coming in though in little in little bursts there's not like there's a written language or there is uh, survivors or there's th no we don't have any of that when it comes to the Olmex. And one one last com uh, comment, and then we'll swing swing back to this. The when we talk about the Mayans or the Incas or the Aztecs or the Toltecs, or Zapotecs, right? Uh, the Mayans, uh, Incas, the the cultures and the civilizations toppled each other. There, there, they, 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 there wasn't like a peaceful handoff to any of this stuff. It just didn't happen. One culture was conquered, you know, and and it was a long series of and and now we we've been dating things. Uh, we talk about 1700 BC, e, uh, you know, 2000 BC. I, 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 my, my take is it goes much, much farther back than that. Uh, the Olmecs are dated. You know, they're given this date of 1700. And, eh, no, 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 no. I think it reaches far back. But th these cultures that rose up and dominated it, huge infrastructure, some of them were just a hundred years in the running. But not you know, just it, that, Jimmy, not just that, but some of these cultures vanished almost overnight. And then, and then another would arise and bang, yes. they would start the sacrifices again. Yes. And it, it, when you think about it in this aspect, when people that are, those that are listening right here, when you put it in that kind of context, it's, it's almost like, it blows your mind when you think about it like that. And I do want to read to you some of the civilizations that practically vanished overnight. And if you listen, the majority, if not all of these civilizations, also practiced human sacrifice. 
But right now we have 656 people watching this live, 214 likes. If you are enjoying the content show so far, show far, get it? Because it's a show. Hit that like button. It lets us know you're enjoying the show. And it lets the YouTube algorithm say, hey, we want more content like this. See, Jimmy laughed at my joke. He thought it was very funny. It was very funny. Thank you. So I can't get over this Olmec image. You know, it's, it's, I mean, is that, is that just absolutely nuts? If somebody, you know, look, like it's a game show, right? And they flash. And what, what culture does this represent? Well, you're going to hear everything but <laughs> Central America. You're going to hear anything but that. It, that is very, very, very strange and beautiful, by the way, stunning. Oh yeah. I think well, the one th- I think the one that we're looking at here, uh, this is six feet tall. Six feet. My goodness. Six feet. Think about that. That's that's just nuts. Beautiful. That's an advanced, advanced, way advanced civilization right there. So one of these civilizations that went missing was the Teotihuacan civilization between 100 BCE and 650 CE. And the city of Teotihuacan was one of the largest cities in the ancient world with a highly sophisticated urban plan and monumental architecture. If you ever go to Mexico, that is one place that you have to visit. But at around 650 CE, the city experienced a sudden and severe decline marked by the burning of many of their structures. And the majority of those structures were their holy structures, their worshiping temples. Okay, that's something that we really need to emphasize here. And the reason behind this decline isn't extremely clear. Archaeologists aren't sure, but they do have some ideas with theories ranging from internal strife to resource depletion to external invasions as well. But could they have had enough of the human sacrifice and not receiving that protection from the gods, not receiving the proper agriculture, not having enough people to sacrifice? Because the population plummeted with the amount of sacrifices they were doing for almost every season, um, for all of their days of worship. People were disappearing, either running away or just being served to the gods and then with all of this with the years of them doing it i think and this is just an opinion here they must have thought to themselves you know what we've been doing this for quite some time we have sacrificed thousands upon thousands of people and you know what i haven't really seen much of a difference do you think it's working here and so no yeah yeah well see here here's the trippy part you you are depending on religious leaders, right? Priests, um, and and to to show, to prove, and so the the things that came into the mix were like an eclipse, right? A, a red moon, you know, something something that could happen naturally but they would call it in advance. And then when that happens, and that that was a, a lot of the proof, a, a, a sudden rainstorm or a thunderstorm that's coming in uh, that was influenced by something else. And that gave these priests and these leaders that kind of power from the population. That's the other part with this. So that's why... Uh, marking calendars and having an accurate way to look at uh, astronomy and and predict these solar events uh, as they happen. A partial eclipse was a really, 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 really big deal. And if you knew in advance when this was going to happen, that made you a mystic. That made you a priest. That made you a prophet. All of those things came into play, and that's why when you say, why, why, why didn't somebody start asking questions? You know, because you kind of look around and go, man, I had a whole family last week. They're all dead. And is this worth it? Well, you know, that's, that's the part. That's the big mystery. And when you look at uh, specifically when you go to uh, Teotihuacan, that's less than 800 years. Okay, so, and when you go to 100 BCE, 
at, at the rise of uh, that culture, it was still small. You know, it's growing. And then it peaked. It got really, really big. And then when it got bad, it went bad. And it went bad really, really fast. And the next thing you know, well, you have to look at the United States. You have to look at the history of the world. You have to look at different cultures. We have seen many civilizations rise and fall, um, some of them in modern history. And uh, the United States is 250 years old, 250 years old. And think of the cycles that we have seen here. We have to go back and look at these different cultures in the past. And they're all in our backyard. You know, so you're talking about uh, Tia Tia Wakan. Yes, if you go down the list and, you, you know, the moche, the moche. I mean, that's the, the chinu. If, uh, if, you know, when we talk about the Aztecs and the Incas, and these are the, the ones that people think of first, there's all of these other, the Zapotecs, right? And we're going to go through each one of these. Somebody came, somebody went, somebody came, somebody went, somebody rose, Somebody came, somebody went uh, right here in North Central and South America. So well, who do you want to cover next? And these are that's very consistent across civilizations, across the world. You're going to have one that conquers another. It, it's really a survival of the fittest here. But the strange thing about the civilizations in Central and South America is that the civilization would literally leave. They would vanish and then a new one would come up and be like, you know what? That's some pretty nice land. That's a nice architecture. Let's come on over and, and conquer it. Because another one was the Mayan civilization from 2000 BCE to 1500 CE. And here there was a dramatic decline between the 8th and 9th century known as the classic Maya collapse. And many of the great city-states of the southern lowlands were abandoned and the monumental inscriptions were seized. And while the northern lowlands and the highlands continued to be inhabited, the reasons behind the sudden decline of the southern lowland cities also remains a subject of debate. Archaeologists do not have a definite answer, which, in my opinion, is saying something. With theories including climate change, warfare, and societal upheaval and constant sacrifice. There it is again, right? Uh, that is a very, very prevalent thing. And I think when people begin to ask questions, that's when it gets very dangerous for those in power. Questioning is this beautiful thing that all of humanity has, but not everyone uses it to their advantage. When we don't get sufficient answers, um, that's when we begin to have doubt. And doubt is very dangerous when there is hierarchy. But in this case, the there was just this decline and and the civilization kind of died out now in other parts of the world we can look at china for instance and the chinese dynasties these dynasties didn't die out in reality it was one clan fighting another it was someone stating i don't really like you as as the emperor i'm going to take you over and we see that in other parts of the world as well but in mexico it's just this level this this type of exception and i find that bizarre and yet it's not something that's necessarily talked about now bringing the the et aspect to this and i'm going to emphasize this again what if, and this is just merely a what if question we do not have the answers to, but what if these gods that they were attempting to appease were at some point, in some point in time, aliens visiting the area and they're like, oh, this is a nice place. Oh, you seem pretty weak. I'm going to go ahead and conquer you. And in order for me to survive and thrive, I need you to do these sacrifices consistently. Um, and again, uh, the, the movie Apocalypto is a really great uh, example of this. It's very gruesome. And if you don't have the heart for it, get it. I don't recommend watching it. Um, they can find the clips on YouTube. Because between you and me, I've never seen the full movie. Mainly because my heart cannot handle that type it's of traumatic. It's traumatic. Trauma, it's traumatic. Right. It's, 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 uh, it's a traumatic. You know what, though? The, the thing is. That's exactly, probably, how it was and how it went down. You know, and, and when you think about um, uh, it, it, it wasn't just any single culture. This You brought this up in the beginning. These ideas, uh, uh, this, this way of running a civilization 
was going on for thousands of miles north and south. It was going on right. in both directions. And, you know, so he he gets kidnapped, right? He gets kidnapped. He gets strung up and walked through. The, he doesn't know what's going on. He's just pulled away from his family, his life, his culture. He's taken to the city, and he's put in line with thousands of other people that were also abducted and kidnapped and uh, uh, walking up the temple getting painted blue, getting marked and getting ready to have your heart cut out. That that was it was that was probably exactly how it went down. Anyway, if we go if we go down let's go down the list here. I'm looking at the clock because we have some uh some other things to go uh over. Um but uh the Inca, I, I brought this up earlier. By the way, your your artwork is just amazing. I mean, you're, it, this is this is really, really, really good stuff. I don't know how you're pulling it off. Inca, fourteen thirty eight to fifteen seventy two. All right, that that's a key number there. Uh, not only uh, how short of a span it was, but the fifteen seventy two part. The Aztecs, fourteen twenty eight to fifteen twenty one. Less than a hundred years, right? Fifteen twenty one. What happened? The Spanish. Inca, 1438, 1572. What happened? The Spanish. You know, same thing with the Mayas. Uh, uh, when when the Spanish arrived, they burned everything. They, you know, what was left of the Mayan culture at that time erased everything. And it makes you wonder, um, as, I, as I go down this list, what did the Spanish, yeah, they were looking for gold. They were looking for silver. They were looking for stuff to get back to Spain so they could fund the monarchy over there. That's the bottom line. But what other artifacts, what other knowledge went back to Spain from these cultures? You got to think about that for a second. That also includes the Mayan. The Mayan codexes, of which there are four, five in the world. They're the only surviving writings and history of the Mayans on planet Earth that we know of are there was there other stuff that was spirited out and 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 brought back to Spain with knowledge of uh, uh, not only engineering and astronomy and mathematics and certainly calendars all of these cultures did that but what about ET what about contact and and what about these other references to the gods? I always find that very, very interesting. Um, uh, what, the Zapotecs, right? 700 BC to 1521. 1521, Spanish, right? Um, you have uh, the Mochi. Uh, they were uh, about 100 to 700 AD in Peru. Um, the the Chimu who succeeded the Mochi, 900 BCE to 1470. Again, that year pops up 1470. But they they were defeated by uh, uh, the Incas. The Incas came in and, and wiped them out. And it was just like one thing after another uh, uh, down there. It's just It's just insane. And looking at the Inca civilization, they occupied parts of Ecuador, Colombia, Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile. Uh, These other civilizations that we have mentioned, the majority of them take place in Mexico. But the Inca civilization was huge. I mean, this was was a ginormous civilization, and they also participated in human sacrifice. Now, when we look at so did the Mochi, and so did the Chimu. Right. And they occupied in the same areas. All practicing the same things, predating the Inca uh, by uh, over a thousand years. Mm. Yeah, I, I like that little that little factoid you dropped in there, Jimmy. Yes, Gives people a nice little timeline. Talking about apocalypto. By the way, if you don't like that kind of gory stuff, a more friendlier version of a movie that you could watch is The Road to El Dorado. It's a uh, child's movie. Um, and it's a good one. It's with actually a really good. Really sound, good. With a good soundtrack. It's actually, it's actually really good. It's really good. Have you been watching Encounters? I don't want to get sideways. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't okay. seen it yet. Okay. All right. All right. So let's move on. I'm, I'm excited. Okay. But moving on to another country here, because the next one I'm going to mention to you is Brazil. And out of 
all of the countries in South and Central America, Brazil gets hit the hardest with very, very bizarre alleged alien encounters. And so I went and I looked at it and I said, you know what, when I think of Brazil, I don't think of ancient civilizations. I think of, you know, very indigenous tribes, but they don't, they don't, document their stuff very well. So I went to the internet and I said, look, what ancient civilizations were there in Brazil during the same time period as the Inca, the Maya, the Olmec, and so on? And I came across the Tupi civilization, which I will be honest with you, I had not heard of them before. And this civilization, it's not incredibly documented, but from what I did find, while these this civilization didn't... Um, didn't didn't have activities of human sacrifice at least to my knowledge they did do cannibalism and yes. this is also something that is very very dark and the big thing is what why even start that like what was the purpose to start it off with there are those in certain civilizations that believe that if you eat the heart or certain parts of the of the human body especially if you're a warrior you're able to kind of harness their strength harness their energy during uh, i want to say i think it was the 1800s i believe the europeans would eat egyptian mummies one as, as like a party trick but also they believed it was like good for them and you could they're called mummy parties they are a real thing and uh they super, were super bizarre but in this case for the tupi civilization and for a handful of indigenous civilizations in south and central america they participated in cannibalism and this is something that Again, it's uh, it's very scary. It's very dark. But how did it start? Was did maybe they get this idea of you know what? Instead of doing sacrifices on other people and giving it and appeasing the gods, what if what if we're the gods? What if we we do all the work and we get the strength? I don't I don't know if that is even their train of thought. But it's something that we've heard before in previous indigenous stories where people would do such things that they had that kind of mentality that the case for the Tupi civilization in Brazil I have no idea because there isn't a lot of documentation until the conquistadors went over to Brazil in the 1500s conquered a lot of it and then started putting in their own culture and religion uh onto these indigenous people but it's something that I thought was worth bringing up here because Brazil is just one of those countries that is whack. Well, okay. So here, okay. I, I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about cannibalism. No. But here's, here's, the, here's the thing about that. Right up until modern history, okay, and, and I'm sure that honestly... It's probably still going on. But there are tribes in Guyana. Now, Guyana, here's South America. Guyana's at the very top, right? Okay, so Spanish loading their ships by. They see the shore. Maybe they're looking for some fresh water. And they're like, man, oh, wait, wait, wait. Boats are coming out. Oh, they're greeting us. Oh, this is great. Oh, oh, okay. They're inviting us to dinner. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, come on in. Well, uh, now all the way up through modern history, there were um uh explorers. I mean, I'm talking about 1900s, right? Uh heading down it, that was like no man's land. Guyana, just stay away, just stay away, just stay away. Don't get close to the shore, whatever you do. And it wasn't the piranhas uh, that you had to worry about. And that this is what was happening. And I, I've i always been not only fascinated with that, but um, it's such a remote part of the world. Uh, that's the first thing. Um, and the second, it, it, it's it's kind of dangerous. And and the third part, it's it's the, the rumors, right? It's it's the mythology uh, that goes along with that. That's what the tribes do. Leave them alone. And that part, Venezuela, right? 
uh, uh, you know, off to one side, Brazil down to the south. That's like the good areas. <laughs> that's that's why the Spanish ended up uh, going into Brazil. I'm convinced of that. The same thing with with Venezuela, Colombia, and Panama, and Costa Rica. You mentioned Costa Rica, and I feel like that's the only, like, super happy country where, like, nothing happens. I've tried looking into it, and I couldn't come across anything. Also, like, the country's slogan is Pura Vida, full of life. And mm-hmm. I'm thinking, you know what? Rock on. Tropical country. It's, it's a beautiful, fruits, it's a beautiful fruits place. Fruits on point. Oh, yeah. And they're just like, there's like that, a little bubble, a little bubble of a country where nothing bad happens there. And I love that. But getting back into this, before we move on, one thing that I did want to touch on is um, in the Mayan culture, they had the Kuklakan. And this was a serpent god. But this particular serpent god was consistent across multiple Mexican mythology, um, including the Mayan and the Aztec. And with different names, but the same look, the same style, and also a god that you needed to do sacrifices for in order to receive their their uh, their blessings here. And this one, people have, have looked at this, have looked at the, the description of this serpent god, and they think to themselves, what if this one's like a like a weird looking alien reptilian kind of thing? Um, and this is something that we could kind of put that mentality on any any ancient god. I'm not saying that's the case, but then we can look at the aspect of anything that does not originate from Earth is an alien. It's gonna be the same thing for demons and angels and all of these gods, those that practiced their religions of worshiping multiple gods. Jimmy, I've received a lot of comments. Uh, I was in the last like six months to be in particular of people writing down, no, what, what you guys are talking about. They're not aliens. Aliens don't exist. They're demons. And, and I don't usually write to those kinds of comments because you can't change their mentality. But if you look at it, demons don't originate on earth. Therefore they are aliens. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was talking about that last night. But, you know, I've seen a lot of that lately. Now, I'm I'm referring to like the last couple of months. And I find that very strange. So, and this is, okay, all right. So I'm just going to be straight. I don't think those are people typing that stuff. I think those are, I, I think that's an AI chat bot coming in to flame out the community and and make these comments because suddenly the, this angel and demons and, and UFO situation is being presented in front of us. If we look back, so I, 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 Christina, I just don't think that there are, now there are elements of society for sure. You go into the Bible belt and it's a very religious area and, and parts of the, of, of uh, the political structure in the military where there are uh, very religious families and people and, and, and stuff. I get that. I, I totally get that part of it. But as far as being part of our community and in here and coming and listening to this show or listening to Fade to Black or Coast to Coast or watching Ancient Aliens, that there's suddenly this this influx of no it's not et it's angels and deep no i just don't i i, I don't feel it I, I i just don't think that that's part of our community um even though tom DeLong has talked about this now i mentioned this last night on the show so yesterday i read uh an article in a catholic uh newspaper magazine about what is going on now over the Vatican. And the Vatican, one of the heads of the Vatican came out and made the comment that you just made publicly, saying that angels, demons, Jesus, the resurrection, aliens, E.T., and UFOs, this conversation has been going on for 2,000 years. And that oh, yeah. it just it, right. I was like, "Whoa, whoa!" So yeah, yeah, absolutely. We have to look at that aspect of it. Um, Diana Pasolka in in her book, American Cosmic, she refers to this constantly, over and over again. Where 
um, different um, uh, parts of our history involve something that seems paranormal, seems supernatural, seems like ET contact, but it's always a religious spin on it. And and it's been going on for a very, very, very long time, predating Jesus. But I can go back to Moses, go back to uh, the Old Testament, you know, one, two, three thousand years uh, before uh, year zero where this was going on. So those connections are there. Today, we call them UFOs. 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, angels and gods. That's right. Also, her work is amazing. If you don't know who she is, look her up her i mean you'll you'll be blown away by her research right now we have 893 people watching this live can we get to 500 likes if you are enjoying the show so far hit that like button jimmy now we're getting into the cases now we're looking at south and central america and looking at these really bizarre stories of very violent attacks and of course of course, we have to start off with number one, and that is Colaris, Brazil in 1977. One of my all-time favorite cases. Why? Because this was the very first story that I came across where cr UFO craft were actually very violent with people. Previous to this case, a lot of times people have a sighting. It's not so bad. In moments, people have been allegedly abducted. Um, yes, it's a little bit traumatic, but for the most part, it's, it's not this dire as for this story where allegedly two people died and a handful, if not hundreds of others, had radiation poisoning, burns, and puncture wounds. I have not come across another story like this one. And this one blows my mind. There's a lot of paperwork I can actually find on it that was conducted and documented by the Brazilian government. And you can find it on the Black Vault. It is definitely worth your time but let's get into this one just to give people at the very least a a brief or i guess a decent summary on this particular case and i will start it off and then you can add your colorful commentary as you do i'm going to share an image here of pictures and documentation people and one of the head captains for the operation Operacion Plato that took place in Brazil in 1977. So let's pull up this image here. So is that uh, Spanish for Operation Plates? Yes, it is Portuguese it, of, for right? saucer, saucer or plate, depending on how right, you want to. Right, right. Think about that. That's what they called it, <laughs> right? Yeah. I like it very much. That. You gotta love that. You oh, gotta yes. love that. Okay, so what do we got here? Okay, so first of all, in this image, we have the captain here, Captain Urange Lima, who was the operator for Operacion Plato. And this is some of the paperwork that was collected by the Brazilian government. Again, a lot of the information, not all of it, a lot of it is made public. This is... Urange Lima's drawing of his close encounter. Here is a woman that had puncture wounds from a UFO craft that the that the town folk described as chupa chupa or sucker sucker here because they believed that these craft would shine this beam of light and that that was kind of sharp that had like these little tubes attached to this light and it would suck their blood now is that true we don't know but there is physical evidence of people having these puncture wounds both men and women and then we have some pictures here that was collected by the brazilian um military here of really balls of light yes but the fact that it was even released publicly in the 2000s by the way even though this took place in 1977 i think you know what that's pretty cool so here in 1977 the residents of Colares, which is a small fishing town were reported numerous sightings of UFOs that they referred to as Chupa Chupa. And the locals claimed that these mysterious lights in the skies were responsible for scars found on their body for women in the, in the chest area, for men in the jugular area, and also on the thighs as well. And in response to these sightings, the residents organized um, like walking in groups at, 
all times of the day, but usually at night, because for six months straight, every single night between 7 and 8 p.m., these craft would show up, and anyone that's walking down the street you were not safe. But even if you were in your own home, at least as the stories go, you still weren't safe. These beams of light would come through the window, come through the walls, come through the roof and give you these types of weird puncture wounds here. And this is something that mortified people. This was terrifying. And you're not going to come across another story with, with this level of these types of details here. So in response to the plea from the, the chief of this small town, he contacts the Brazilian military. The Brazilian military come along and they said, okay, we're going to look into this. And the, the civilians were like, yes, they're going to bring weapons and cannons and tanks. I, I'm, I'm ready Ready to be saved <laughs> right right well okay, let me let me jump in and say one thing the claris for a few months was being terrorized and nobody wanted to go out at night nobody wanted to leave their houses the the streets were deserted and the the thought of if you went outside you were going to get zapped they were seeing these craft by the way so the 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 people of the town saw the connection, saw these beams of light, saw people getting injured, and that's all it takes. And it it virtually got shut down. Got to the point where, um, and I can't imagine where you know the mother of of children uh, trying to protect their children, trying to protect the the, the family, the 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 position that they all found themselves in. They were scared to death. They were out of their minds. So, yes, they turn around and reach out to the Brazilian military, hoping that the the the, the cavalry is going to show up and, and save the town. Well, that's not what happened. What happened next? Instead of bringing weapons to protect this small fishing town, they brought papers and pencils, cameras. And cameras. <laughs> And right. because they wanted to study the phenomenon, but not actually protect the people, which is demoralizing. It's it, it's terrible um, for these people. Right now, for those that are familiar with the UFO phenomenon that I've been studying it even for a few weeks. Right. You know, you can't win. You can try all you want to shoot those down, and there has not been any level of success, at least that has been made public. It seems that maybe this Brazilian military that was coming from the capital, Brasilia, might have had an idea about this. And they said, you know what, instead of shooting these things down, let's just uh, document it and, and see and see what happens. And they did exactly that. So they were there for a handful of months run by this man right here, Orange Lima. And people were furious. They said, look, we asked you to come here. We are expecting to be protected. And you're just... And you're just here doing nothing. And you you're want us to house you? Right, right. You're videotaping. They were camped out on the beaches. They had two or three film crews that were there. They had a film crew downtown. Uh, they were there for over three months. That's three months. They were there videotaping and documenting stuff every single night. It was actually for the, for the Brazilian military. They collected a lot of stuff. Um, but you're right about that. There were there were no shoot downs. Uh, there wasn't anything like that going on. Uh, it, it turned out to be the collection of data and 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 science. It was uh, pretty amazing. Now, what where where did all of that information go? We've had some things you know come out, but uh, Christina, you and I have talked about Calaris uh, many many times. They have months months of footage months not one night not a couple of seconds not not a 22 second tic tac video we've got months 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 of it uh, where where did it go did it go to the united states is it still in brazil i would love to see all of that 
which is something that many people want to see. And we have to thank the late A.J. Javard, a uh, Brazilian ufologist who's able to get that information from the Brazilian military to make not all of it, but a decent amount public, including testimonies. So military officials were walking around the town and asking people what they were seeing, what they were witnessing, and if they had been injured in any way. And people consistently, and you can find a lot of these testimonies um, in the documentation, you can find it at the Black Bolt. But people were stating that these beams of light, they felt like they were being hunted by these craft very, very much like the movie Predator, if you if you ask me, that's kind of what it sounds like. And it's something that scared a lot of people. But what's even more terrifying is that one, they couldn't do anything about it. But when these people had this beam of light on them, they would become paralyzed, they couldn't move. Now, this little detail is consistent in a lot of UFO encounters where there's a beam of light, people aren't able to move. And you can see this across the across the planet. But here, it's happening every single night for six months. That's insane. And then this story was kind of swept under the rug. No one really talked about it. If you attempt to go to Kolaris today and you speak to any of the locals that were alive during that time frame, they will not talk about it. They're, they, it, It's too taboo for them. But it wasn't until 1997, exactly 20 years later, did Captain Urange Lima come forward to talk to ufology, ufologists, A.J. Javard and Marco Antonio Petit, writers for the UFO magazine, and he relayed his stories and he mentioned that that not only was he documenting what was happening in Kolaris, but he also had encounters and not just him, but also those that were serving under him as well. Now, he did come forward and he said it and he said it all um, all on record which is absolutely fascinating that we have the top man, the top tier guy coming and telling a story. And, and he goes into pretty great detail of the encounter that he had with this small gray looking alien that I'm moving my cursor around that hugged him from behind and spoke to him who, um, who spoke to him in a, in, in Portuguese, but in a very metallic voice stating I'm not, I'm not here to hurt you, um, so just be calm. And <laughs> that would scare anybody. But then the story gets even weirder, Jimmy, because not only did he have these encounters and mention it on record, but three months later, he allegedly committed suicide. That's right. Three months after going to UFO magazine and sharing his stories and telling the world that what he encountered was real. It's it, it, there. It, and we have the same situation with Varginia, too, as well. And uh, where uh, uh, those the military leaders that were in charge of the, the went public and said, OK, this is what happened. This is what's going on. Let me show you this. And then uh, suddenly they die. And well, well, Jimmy, Jimmy, I've, I mean, on that, on that, everyone who knew him said he was very happy and a cheerful mm -hmm. guy and nice yep. to be around. And no yep. one even thought in their minds that he would take his own life. Yep, 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 yep. Um, and, and the work of James Fox, uh, who, who is here, um, I, I was watching in the, uh, the new Steven, uh, uh, Spielberg series encounters. Uh, there's a, there's a quick shot there, uh, when they're talking about the Stephenville, uh, Texas, uh, situation and they're live on CNN and they're live from Stephenville, uh, Texas. Anyway. Yeah, there, there it is. Uh, in, in, in this one shot, you see this very young James Fox with dark hair and he's, he didn't say anything. He, he he's like, but anyway, it was, it was pretty interesting to see that last night. Um, but it's the work of people like James and, and others right now uh, looking into all of this. I just had um, Timothy Alberino on the show. Now let's, uh, let's swing this over to Peru and, and talk about what uh, recently went down there. Now we did a, a, a 
pretty uh, deep show about that. But he uh, just left the country, and he's down there right now. He's in Peru going to that village. He's going to go and try to find angry miners with jetpacks. Yeah. And he's he's going to get to, he lived down there for a long time, and he's been to that specific village. Um, so he's down there right now. And right on the heels of all of this, with everything else that's going on, we've got the Peruvian mummies and, and what's going on now. And the, 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 the Mexican Congress, you and I did uh, an excellent show uh, about that. Um, and all of what takes us right back to what we're talking about. All of these indigenous cultures, all of the contact and everything that has been going on from Brazil to Bolivia to Peru to Chile to Argentina to Guyana up through Venezuela, uh, Colombia, Panama, Costa Rica, Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, San Salvador, of course, Mexico, that all of these cultures lived in this very, not only a vast area, but interconnected with roads and highways and pyramids and temples and, and, and this, this apparent ET contact, the Mayan culture, uh, if you go to Belize, you just mentioned Costa Rica. If you go to Belize, if you buy a house in Belize, right, it's probably built on Mayan stones. There are, did you know, I'm just going to leave you with this little factoid. This is two years ago. They were trying to bulldoze in Belize Mayan pyramids to build condos. That's how many pyramids. Yeah, I know. That's how many pyramids are there. They are in the way. (laughs) <laughs> That's how big this culture was. And and with, with LIDAR and the ground penetrating radar uh, going across and looking underneath the jungle canopy, which is thick and, and covers so much of Central America, that uh, everything is overgrown. And they're trying to build highways right now. Do you know that in Mexico... Right now, uh, they've got a huge infrastructure uh, uh, thing that is going on, and they're building these highways. But they have to stop the building of the high if they find something, because the Ministry of Culture's got to come in, the archaeologists come in, the the freeway stops, everybody stops working while they do the dig, and and. It's 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 important that they do that, but the point is, they're not making any progress because they keep bumping into another temple, another pyramid, another religious site, uh, bodies, tombs, roads, uh, aqueducts. They're finding all of this stuff, and they have to stop what they're doing. That's how big and large this was, and then gone overnight. It's when we look at any ancient civilization, there's so much fascination, and yet there's so much mystery for a lot of these places because, especially when looking at Mesoamerica, they just disappear, they just vanish. And the question, the the million, billion, bajillion dollar question is why, 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 why here? But looking at another case, actually, no, I want to talk about uh, Peru, just very touching on it, because this is the most recent case in South America, where you are dealing with people being terrorized by extraterrestrials, at least allegedly. It is so awesome to hear that you know someone that is going to go there and do the research. That is like, that is like a godsend. That is what we all want um, because it's something that fuels a lot of our curiosity. But when we're looking at this, this is another location that we're not going to see in any else, like no other part of the world where people are allegedly being terrorized, being hunted, and people are scared of these extraterrestrials. Uh, or are they just jetpack miners that have a, a 
crap ton of money and they're like, oh, no, we're going to scare these people to just to make a profit. Um, first of all, you need to like practice how to use a jetpack. Second, they're incredibly loud. And third, they're like, what, 600? They're a lot. They're a lot. of. It's a lot. Millions. Okay. Million. There's only I don't a know couple. Of, there's only a couple in the world. OK, there's, it's a, not there's like only it's, a. Well, <laughs> well, the, the, the thing is, the thing is that it's something that uh, I'm glad that we touched on. Now, right now we have a thousand and twenty six people watching this. Can we get to 600 likes? If you're enjoying the show, hit that like button. We still have a few more cases for you. Moving on to our next one. And this one took place also in Brazil because Brazil is one of those wacky countries here where we are looking at uh, Sao Paulo in 1957. And I'm just going to briefly go over this one because we just have so many cases. This is a cover. crazy case, though. This is this is a crazy case. This one is. Do you want to tell it? Well, I mean, uh, 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 it's uh, it, it's Fort Itaipu, right, in, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, 1957. Um, I, I'm just going off of my memory, everybody. It, you know, you can go and look up uh, the specifics of the case. It's well documented. But it was like, um, I, I remember this case. My birthday is October 10th. And this happened uh, like October 17th. And so whenever I see October, I remember things. That's how I tie this together. So it was like October 17th, October 18th, 1957. It was a weekend. Um, it was a nice day. Um, most of, because it was the weekend, most of the uh, garrison, the military uh, personnel at the base were away. They went home for the weekend and they're, they're doing their thing. But we had some soldiers that were left uh, to patrol and, and man the base. And so they're out there at three o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday, a beautiful day. When they see two, um, as they describe them, two lights come down from the sun. Now that's how that's how they describe. So obviously it's three o'clock in the afternoon. Here's the sun, and you know here's noon. You know it's three o'clock. Here's the sun, and the, the lights approach them in the middle of the day. As they looked up, the sun was there. So they described it as they came from the sun, but not out of the sun, just from that direction at three o'clock in the afternoon. Comes down and starts shooting. <laughs> right? and, and and now two 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 of the soldiers um got injured, passed out, you know, and they came to and they were like, man, the last thing that I remember, <laughs> right? Was flying saucers uh were coming down out of the sky. What happened? And now I'm going to stop right there for a second, and I would love your insight on this. But this is a case where, um, and I get it, I understand, you mentioned this earlier, our alien brothers and sisters, you know, uh, peace Allegedly. Loving. Yeah, yeah, benevolent, and, and uh, you know, everything is cool, and they're here to help us save the planet and our pollution and stop nuclear war. Okay, I, I get that. Right, they're here to help us cure cancer. Okay, I, I I get that, and that's partly true. I am sure that's part of it. And then you have a case like this, where um, when somebody says, "Now, so you have let's 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 stop here," and then I want your input. Maybe that is the case. And when something like this happens, like Mike Herrera talked about the other night on Fade to Black, that maybe it's us acting like UFOs, right? Attacking ourselves. And, and maybe that's the case. Is this an, a, 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 false, a, a false flag, a fake alien invasion type of situation? So these soldiers will tell that story that way. Well, you know, um, I don't know. What do you think? I think that is something worth considering. Everything needs to be on the table. And I feel like we talked about this last week for the Catalina Island uh, episode. We we kind of kind of touched on this, but it's something that it's worth mentioning. The military like playing 3D chess 
that most people don't understand. And I'm in that category. And I, I'm not even going to deny that. <laughs> but but it, but here with this case, it's it's bizarre because two of these military officials, they had this beam of light shine on them. They had radiation poisoning. Some of their clothes caught on fire. Correct. Okay? Uh, which is very scary for literally anybody. I, fun. I, I plugged a little bit too much into one of my uh, strips, like strip lights, whatever, electricity strips, and it caught on fire. And let me tell you, I was very scared. So for clothes to catch on fire, I'd be mortified here. But in this case, it's something that you don't hear in other parts of the world. Has it probably happened before and hasn't been documented? Possibly. There, there, there's, there's a chance of that. But here, this one that took place in Brazil in 1957, it's documented. These officials have spoken about it. And it's one that makes you scratch your head. Okay, if it is us, why? Why bother? Well, look at, you know, and when we, when we look at the, uh, the angry jetpack miners, right? Think about that story and that spin that was put on it, right? An, an immediate deflection going in, in that direction. And and I and I, you have to stop and think about that. You know, it it's it's the people are saying one thing, you know, what they witnessed and 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 how they saw it, and the military steps in, the navy comes into town and says, no, that's not. We've done an investigation, and this is what what this is what happened. And you have a girl, a girl, a, a fifteen year old girl that was assaulted, injured, throat slashed. No arrest. If if you know it, who it was, and you've done your investigation, then then who did it and who got arrested and and who is being held in custody for this and and is expected to answer for their crimes? No, they don't do that. And when we look at here, uh, you know that the people of this village are crazy. And th th when we look at that aspect of, of all of this, and I want everybody to, li to listen to me very closely, for years and years and years and years, people that have seen something in the sky were called crazy. And people, have, if they saw something in the sky, they wouldn't talk about it for fear of being called crazy. And this was the answer uh, for for so long, for so many years. And here we find ourselves uh, today when we're talking about this. The crazy part doesn't hold water anymore, Christina. You, you can't say that. And that was always a weapon. It was a way to put the fear in, in somebody was uh, the blowback and the ridicule, and you didn't want to be teased. You didn't want to be bullied. You didn't want to walk down the street and be looked at funny. You didn't want to have the effects come back on your family or your children. So you kept all of this stuff to yourself. But I witnessed testimony that we're talking about, the people that we are calling crazy. That's good enough to put somebody in prison. That's good enough to get somebody convicted for murder. It's good enough to have somebody executed, but yet if we make these claims about seeing something in the sky or seeing something attack a girl in our village, we're called crazy and we're called liars, right? And then and, and the same people that are doing that will turn around and, and, and have a religious spin on this and it's okay to, to have religious beliefs. And something that you can't touch, tell, or s smell, or taste. You you can have those beliefs, but you can't. Somebody that sees something in the sky is called crazy. It's 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 so bizarre to me. I just don't understand it. And and you're really treading on taboo here, Jimmy, because religion is just something that people, for the most part, don't touch because you're you're dealing with faith and belief, and that's something that people won't change unless they have an experience or unless they're very open minded and look at all the data. But putting the two and two together, while well, I find that absolutely fascinating, don't get me wrong here, I love I love both of them when they're when they're together as friends. 
Um, it's just something that is, it's very yeah. difficult to talk about. Yes, 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 yes. It is very difficult to talk about. And sometimes we have to address the elephant in the room, right? And and the elephant in the room is, okay, Jesus, Jesus rose up and saved the universe, right? Resurrected, died on the cross, right? That you can believe in that. That's fine. I don't care. That's, 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 do your thing, but don't tell me I didn't see what I saw, right? You can't have it both ways. How can you deny somebody who has <laughs> called somebody a liar and is making it up when they say that they saw something in the sky? Or that they made contact when we're talking about what I think the same thing. It's it's a bizarre thing that we find. I I, I it just it just angers me. It just angers me. I don't care what people do. I don't care what you believe in. I don't care what what floats your boat. I, but don't don't turn it around and and bring it on me or the people of this community in a negative way. You can't have it both ways. So there you go. I think you brought up a really great point and people in the live chat are agreeing with you. They're like, Jimmy, great point. And <laughs> it's something that definitely needs to be talked about and considered because for the most part, people will not tread on, on that side of the field. They won't because it's very, very taboo. But the way that you addressed it, it makes it more digestible for people. And even Android saying, preach, Jimmy. Preach well, it. Yeah, but, but Thanks, see, Android. see I, I, you know, well, I'm just going to say thank you for that first off. But from where I sit, Christina, from where I sit, and I've been doing this for such a long time, where I I interview and have conversations and I'm, I'm out in the community and conferences and traveling. And it, it, this is the one aspect to me where uh, I... If I look back historically, L.A. Marzulli is, is so elegant about this. And I just talked about Timothy Alberino. He's so elegant. Uh, Bringing in some view. great names today, Jimmy. Yeah, yeah. It, that that when we look back in a historical context, right, and and the absolute fantastical, crazy things to say, like... Moses goes up on the top of Mount Sinai, talks to God, gets some rules, carves a thing, comes down, makes the Ark of the Covenant, right? <laughs> Got to layer this in gold, and 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 a beam of light is going to guide us through the desert because we're lost, and manna from heaven is going to be sent down from a, all of that. That's okay. But you want to tell me that there's no life in the universe, that ETs are not visiting us and that we have not had our encounters? We're talking about the same frigging thing. But nobody wants to talk about that in public. They're uncomfortable about talking about the religious aspect to this. I, it's that, That's it. You know, I'm just so done. It, it's frustrating to me to get uh, accused of and pointed at and not, not only just me, but you know, the community itself from people that do go to church on Sundays. It's like, wait a minute, you can't have one without the other. So if you're going to believe in that, which is fine, then you need to allow us our same space. And, and that's it. That's right. That's where I stand. So thank you for that. And, and, and well, I'm you're, just you're, here to, you're, I'm you're just here to make people angry. I'm you're just, just putting up you're just putting a perspective out there for people to 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 kind of get your mentality, get your standpoint. And while not everyone might agree, it doesn't matter if they agree with you or not. But as long as they get an understanding, at least where you're coming from. But in conclusion, what is it about South and Central Americas which gives rise to so many negative and savage UFO encounters? Like, what are your theories on this? And I want to hear your theories, Jimmy, and everyone that is watching this right here, right now. Let me know in the live chat. Let me know in the comments. I do try to read all the comments. But what is your answer to that question? And j Rowe, thank you so much for that and for supporting the channel. Jimmy, before yeah, that's into... it, but that's that's the spin that will always be put on it. And so let me explain. 
if um, uh, if if there is life in the universe, like there should be, right? We are not unique. We're just a representation of everything else that is that is throughout our galaxy, the Milky Way, and continuing on into the infinite universe. Life is everywhere. So, uh, if you look at the micro us, Earth, the macro is everything else. You look at the micro, you look at us, we have got really good people on this planet. We've also got some really bad ones, right? We just do. And that same idea has to be throughout the universe. It's not everything is great. And it's not that everything is bad. And that all aliens are evil and they're here to overtake this planet. All aliens are good. They're protecting us from the bad aliens. And they're the ones that... But uh, it, it's simply not the case. There's going to be good. There's going to be bad. And the spin that you hear is the spin that you want to hear. So you're going to hear from somebody that says all aliens are, are, are the, there's no evidence of any bad things going on. There's no evidence of that. They're only here to help us. You're going to hear that. If that's what you want to hear, that's all you are going to hear. Then you have others that have had some very violent, bad encounters. People have died, and they're going to put that spin on it. If that's what you want to hear, that's your belief system. You know, that's it. It's the spin that you want to put on it. For me, look at us. There's good, there's bad. There's ones and zeros. There's black and white. There's positive and negative. And that's what runs the universe. That's it. That's it. Yeah, there isn't another way to look at it. That was a great way to to say that. And I think people can agree. But we have one final case. And this is one that I wasn't familiar with at all. And this took place in 1977 in Uruguay. Now, I always enjoy saying that country. It just, it just, it just rolls off the tongue so nicely. But here... Angel Maria Tona, a rancher from Salto, Uruguay, and his family experienced a series of uneventful UFO sightings on their cattle ranch. Now, just listen to this because this story is wild and also a little bit sad if you're a dog lover. So the most notable incident occurred on February 8th when Tona and his foreman witnessed a fiery disc light object displayed a rocking motion breaking off the branches of a tree near the barn and it emitted in a very intense light and heat causing electrical disturbances and physical discomfort on those that had witnessed it in particular Tona. And when the object started moving toward him, he noticed six beams of light, like small wings, three on each side. And at that point, he said he felt electric shocks, which went all through his body and a very intense heat hit him as well. He flung his arms over his face to shield his eyes. And he said he felt attracted to the light and couldn't move, almost like a moth, if you ask me. And he says here, I don't know if I could move or didn't want to. That was really interesting. But here's where it gets really sad because he had a dog named Topo. And he experienced pretty abnormal behavior after the incident and was found dead three days later. The autopsy report of the dog, which backing up just a little bit, the dog witnessed the UFO uh, barking at it and... And then bad things happened right after that. And something with dogs and UFOs, I mentioned this yesterday in yesterday's episode, actually. And I got some really great commentary when it comes to that. But dogs seem to be a little bit more sensitive to UFOs than people. They're able to see them before people do. They're able to sense them before people do a, a handful of the times. And they bark at it. But in some respects, they're also very, very scared of these craft in the sky. And I received a really awesome comment of someone mentioning that maybe they are projecting this sound that only dogs can hear that people can't. I'm like, huh? Okay, that's interesting. But going back to this, could be, I don't know. But back to the story, 
Topo, the dog, revealed several abnormal findings in the autopsy report, suggesting exposure to unnatural and extreme heat conditions. The animal's hair was found to be sticky and hard, and the normally solid fat under the skin was, was discovered on the outside, indicating exposure to, a, to very high temperatures that melted the fat, allowed it to seep through the pores before solidifying again. And there were extensive internal bleeding due to the ruptured blood vessels and broken capillaries, likely caused by unnaturally increased temperatures, leading to a fatal reduction in circulating blood volume. The liver and blood vessels were abnormally yellow, indicating of uh, indicative of high fever. And despite these internal issues that I had just read to you, there were no external marks, no bruises or burns found on the skin, concluding that the animal was exposed to something extremely hot, but it didn't show on the outside. It didn't show on the outside. And, you know, in, in, with this case, and what a way to end the show, by the way, um, I, I was going to, well, I didn't, I was going to hold back on all of those details. Right, and, and I, I just you went there, you went there, it, it, it boiled from the inside out. Now that kind of makes me think of, and I don't want to go here, but but radiation or microwaves and and that kind of idea, um, spontaneous human combustion. I thought where, you were going to say Skinwalker Ranch. I really did. No, no, no. We can go skin. Go. I, I'm not going Skinwalker yet, but but that. Uh, you know, the blood boiling and uh, to, to the point where combustion happens, um, and that appears to be the case here. Very strange case. Um, it, yeah, and, and to, to I'm just a pet lover. I'm, you know, I'm a dog lover. You know, we don't want to hear these things. But anyway, that was a very strange case. Uruguay, Paraguay, Uruguay, Paraguay, um, down in South America. And that was back in 1977. So, um, I've got guests here. I've got to run, um, Christina, just thank you. This was a, a great, fun, amazing show. Uh, uh, the, the chat was just absolutely alive. Did we hit 700? Yeah, we're about to hit 700 right now. Um, so all of that is fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Um, tonight on uh, Fade to Black, of course, I've got Randall Carlson. So I'll see everybody tonight on the show. In the meantime, Christina, behave and be well. Um, I'm going to miss you next week. Going to miss you next week. All right. But, but I'll be back. I'll be back soon. I'll be back all soon, right. everybody. Well, all I'll right. I'll be waiting for you after you come back from Egypt. Egypt. Yeah, I'm going to Egypt. You know, something you got to do what you got to do, you know, so so I'm going to head over there for a little bit, but I'll be back soon. Everybody, uh, I'll see you tonight. But if I don't see you tonight, on Fade to Black. Have a great, safe, fun and amazing weekend. Christina, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. One more thing to add about this case is not only did the dog suffer from intense heat, but Tona, the dog owner, also had radiation poisoning as well. And he received some redness and discomfort on his arms when he was covering his eyes from this incredibly bright light, these electrical shocks that went through him, and he was able to feel the heat as well. When I said, Jimmy, did it remind you of Skinwalker Ranch? Because one of the very famous stories when it comes to that location is one dog or several dogs that turned into goo when they were chasing a blue orb and then this light kind of beamed on them and then the next day when the when the rancher went to go look at find his dogs they were just like puddles um which is super 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 very sad in this case it kind of reminded me of that but you're, i haven't found another case that is similar to this one why because south and central america they just have these incredibly violent encounters and the biggest question is why out of everywhere in the world why is why are these areas getting the most attention from these very violent craft uh potentially extraterrestrials as well what is going on why is it happening there does it have any connection any correlation with these ancient civilizations that practiced human sacrifice really not that long ago is there any connection there 
I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Please let me know in the live chat. Please let me know in the comments. I do try to read all the comments. Your opinions and your insights are very, very valuable, not only to myself, but to everyone else that reads them as well. So please go ahead and do that. Hit the like button if you enjoyed the show. Subscribe if you haven't already, because we do three live shows right here on this channel, sometimes for every single week. So hit that notification bell because tomorrow is strange news at 3 p.m. PST, where I'll be covering all the mysterious news and areas from around the world. Everyone else is a little bit itchy there. Excuse me for that. So you do not want to miss that show. Also follow me on Twitter at eyes underscore on the skies for all of my updates and news. Mark Tasaka. Thank you so much. I always appreciate that. Um, also, take a look at my Instagram at Strange Paradigms for pictures and short videos. And lastly, take uh, please look at the Discord server with 2,000 other like-minded members. Share your thoughts, your insights, your experiences, and more. I know one of my amazing moderators will share that link in the live chat. I want to say thank you to everyone watching this live, all the Super Chats, Super Stickers, YouTube members, Patreon supporters, and of course, all of my incredible moderators. I simply could not do this show without you. If you are enjoying the content on this channel, consider being a Patreon supporter. All the funding goes straight to the channel to puck the puck wedgie and to the RV fund where I'll be traveling the United States, hitting all the UFO and paranormal hotspots, documenting it and taking you on the journey with me. That is it for today. I will see you tomorrow. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies.